All right. Now I get the pleasure, because as we said, Pastor Rob was not supposed to be here this week. I get the pleasure of introducing a man. It says Pastor Jack Savage, I'll be honest with you. <coughs> if I believe, well, I knew he had a name, but for the first three months I knew him, I knew him as Pop Pop. Um, <laughs> he is a pastor. He is also the owner of Jack's Religious Gifts in Salisbury, which is, they do it by appointment now, but if you ever need anything, call them, because he has an amazing selection. But also, he is, his granddaughter is one of my daughter's best friends, and so when Selah introduced me, it was, this is my Pop-Pop, and I went, hi, Pop-Pop? <laughs> but if you have kids and grandkids know, sometimes you're just somebody's mommy or Pop-Pop. So, he is, like I said, been retired. He used to be over at Mount Hermon United Methodist Church. I have had the pleasure of hearing him sing and speak a little. This is the first time I get to hear him preach an entire message, so I'm really super excited. So we all help me give a warm Odyssey welcome to Pastor Jack Savage. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure to be here. Uh, you may find I've called Rob up and get him to move this table over. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've had the, I'll just share this with you a little bit. I've had two triple bypass surgeries, and this year a couple strokes, and a uh, uh, valve job, a pacemaker, and a defibrillator. <laughs> and get everything done. But thank the Lord, I'm still, still here, still serving Him. And uh, this is the first time everything I've, I've spoke anywhere in in over a year, and um, just have not been able to. So if you see me shaking and see this table shaking, it's not because I'm nervous, it's just because that's what's going on in my body. I'd like to sing a song for you just before we start, but uh, and then we'll have the scripture read. That this is one I, I, I really like. It's called, He Looked Beyond My Faults and He Saw My Needs. Uh -huh. oh, today, Matthew 23, verse 27 through 29. 25 to 26. I'm sorry, 25 to 20. Let me, yeah. <laughs> I looked up there. 25 to 26. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup in the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. With what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the monuments of the God godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we had lived in the day of our ancestors, we would, have, we would never have joined them in killing the prophets. But in saying that, you testify against yourself that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Okay, thank you. Amen. And you may say, wow, why did he choose that scripture? Well, I hope you'll find out as we go along with the message. So let us talk to Jesus. Jesus, you know this vessel. You know my weaknesses. You know my strengths. And I have said today, you use it all for your glory. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. We live in an age, you know, when our conversations and our communications with each other sometimes gets a little bit confusing. I remember being in line, and some of you, well, I know remember this and have experienced it yourself, but I remember being in line at a, a funeral. And uh, 
people were in front of me. And one lady came up to me, my, doesn't she look good? The other lady behind me, well, my, she really does look good. Well, the mortician had done a great job in making her look good, but she was dead. Then, as, just as if the Spirit were speaking to me, it, it said, looking good, but dead. Almost as quickly, I, I had the thought that came to my mind that says, I think this can be related to the church and to us as Christians. I'm terrified. I, I, I kind of thought, you know, wow, this is something to think about. Think about it. Looking good, but did. Surely the person who made that original statement did not really intend that she was a living body or that she was in good health because she knew she was dead. The individual was deceased. Sounded like life was clearly death. There she was, dead, but we say she looks good, or he looks good. The comment, the comment had nothing to do with the true condition of the person in whom we were talking about. It was a compliment of the mortuary, the mortician who made the dead look like the living. A skill and surely a comforting feeling for the family and the friends of that dear departed loved ones. Nevertheless, their relative and their friend was dead. And as I began to process that thought, I became fully aware that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I had not merely eavesdropped on those two ladies in front of me in their conversation, but I had heard what they said, and many times have even said it myself. The Holy Spirit was calling my attention to the need for the God's church to examine its priorities regarding its looks and its health. The Spirit is explaining that good health is more important than good looks. Excuse me, I'm, I'm shaking a little bit here. Uh, Rob, would, would you come and just set this table up here? I need something a little sturdier. In, in, in this hand. I'm sorry. You're all good. Yeah, just separate it. Just, this is fine. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Sorry for that interruption. As I said, this explain that God explains to explained to me that good health is more important than good looks. I was being told that the church must not surrender its healthy mission for a sick substitute. It must not value outward appearance above inner wellness. I was convicted that too often churches worry more about what people think about them than what God knows about them. There are churches that care more about looks than good health. And I, I, you know, I've, I've been in some of those churches. Where, oh my, we don't want any children running around. They're gonna mess up our walls. They're liable to spill something on our chairs. And you know what? Those churches don't have any children. Mm. I pastored a church like that one time. When I went there, it was all basically older people. And the first time we had somebody that came with a child and the child cried a little bit, I was, I was in my sermon, and I just stopped. I said, y'all listen to this. You've not heard this in a long time in the church. <laughs> and they hadn't. But, but I was so glad to see that church grow and children come in and have a Sunday school. They didn't have a Sunday school. They didn't have a Sunday school, and, and they just watched the people as they grew. We're now living in an age when organized religion is enjoying a good time because uh, our society has gone through a good time. Right now, some churches are hurting financially. But you know what I find in all the churches that I've worked with? I find that if a church is doing something, people will support it. And I hear that uh, the different things that are going on here is good works for the Lord. It is time when the Christian churches should be sharing 
with what's going on in our society as far as the wealth people given to the church. Yet there are many who believe this may not be the church's finest hour. They worry that while we are outwardly successful, we may not be genuinely faithful. We sang and talked about the word faith earlier today. Therefore, in the midst of such material success and challenging opportunities, we are confronted with the critical question, you look good, but are you well? You may remember some of the commercials that used to be on television. Some of you may be old enough to remember these. About uh, Charlie Tuna. <laughs> remember Charlie Tuna? He would talk about how, how he had good taste. But then the commercial would come on and say, yeah, but Charlie, we don't want good taste. We want tuna that tastes good. <laughs> and that's the same way with people today. They don't always want a church. Now, some do that looks good, but they want a church that is well and lively inside. In the same way, Jesus reminds us that he is looking for a healthy church. He is seeking a wholesome community of faith. He wants his church to be well and not merely look good. Much of what we experience in today's world conditions us to look at the outside. We are a culture with great emphasis on appearance. If we can make the product look good, we can become satisfied with it. However, those who are in the business confirm that presentations, you watch your commercials on TV, if they can make those commercials look good enough, we'll respond to the product. But if the product isn't good enough, we cease our response. We cease buying that product. This little tidbit about commercials is also true about the church. Packaging may, for the moment, or for a little while, and to some worshipers, make the church appear healthy. However, in due season, its sickness will be revealed and its uselessness will be exposed. Today, the Christian church faces several very serious questions. Critical among them is, can a sick, decrepit, seriously ill, or even dying church actually appear healthy, vigorous, and alive. There are many scripture references validating the front promise that if churches are not spiritually healthy, Jesus often condemned those who appeared to be godly, but were actually ferocious wolves. If you have your Bible, and then sometime later read it in Matthew 7, 15. When some tried to give the impression that they were faithful followers by calling him Lord, you remember what happened? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's in Luke 6, 46. Some of Jesus' stern rebukes were to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and who were they? They were the religious leaders. But Jesus sure did not speak most kindly of them. Whom he called, these religious leaders, he called them hypocrites in Matthew 23, 23 to 26. Not only did Jesus recognize and affirm the presence of the religious counterfeit, he also warned us to be aware of them. In Matthew 7, 15, he said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. I think of that commercial on television where the grandmother, you know, she sneezes and has, uh, what is it, hook and call her, but she becomes a wolf. <laughs> she has the hook, she has the, the cough, but she looks good as grandmother, but then when she calls, she has that wolf face comes on, and uh, that's kind of the same idea. As, as a matter of fact, we are so conditioned that in many instances, we seem to prefer counterfeit rather than what's real. The, the FBI, you know, when they train their men to find counterfeit money, what they do is they don't say, here's some counterfeit money, feel this. What do they do? Here's the real money, feel of it, feel of it, feel of it, until you know how it feels. And we as Christians need to experience that same thing 
the real thing until we know exactly what is real. And you know, that this is why it's so good when I heard you say, and of course I knew it anyway, but that you were having Bible study and, and, and the messages that the pastor brings are messages that help you grow spiritually. We need to grow spiritually in our own life or we too will be like a church that isn't faithful and be useless to the world. Uh, I was shocked you know, <laughs> for myself <coughs> that I, I, I got to the place where I was eating margarine. And I really like margarine okay. But I started going to a restaurant and they had real butter. <laughs> well, that taste that I had for margarine kind of changed back to the taste of the real thing. Again, we want the real thing. Authentic Christianity requires of us a genuine commitment to pursue the real. Jesus challenges us to choose what is healthy and wholesome. The tempter of this world, the devil, he would always like to encourage people of faith to accept his alternative to God's truth. Even when unattractive, we must affirm that that which is good, that which is goodly, over that which looks good but is not. Listen to this statement. A sick church cannot save a sick world. A sick church cannot save a sick world. This time is much like Jesus' words from Matthew 15, 14, when he said to the disciples, and you know this story, if a blind leads the blind, both will fall into the pit. Jesus needs a healthy church to effectively minister to the sick and dying humanity. Jesus understood his understanding and motivation for our mission was spiritual. For him, initiating action is spiritually motivated. Everything we do, we want it to be spiritually motivated. Today, many churches are more spirited than they are spiritual. Did you get that? Many churches today are spirited more than they are spiritual. To be spirited merely means to be full of spirit, lively, energetic, peppy, vigorous, vivacious, and maybe even banksy. In a spirited worship, people are made to feel good. Nothing wrong with feeling good. Spirited worship is dynamic. It can be cheerful, upbeat, exhilarating, uplifting, stimulating, motivating, all the different positive terms. Yet, as great as these may be, they do not define spiritual. Common expressions of praise from persons who attend such worship when they leave the service is usually I really like their worship. I feel like I feel much better when I go to church. I truly am motivated when I leave church. Surely these are good, wonderful comments about church, but do, do they translate into spiritual? I will be among the first to admit that spirited worship, while not necessarily spiritual, is far more attractive than a dead, lifeless, depressing, dry, and uninspiring church service. However, in a healthy church, people are not forced to substitute spirited for spiritual. They, do, they don't have to choose between the two because genuine worship can be both. We can enjoy it. It can be joyful as you have here and also be spiritual as well. When Jesus met the woman at the well, she perceived his prophetic powers and was prepared to hear him. He told her, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. When Jesus spoke these words, he was not referring to spiritual worship, 
Rather, he was pointing her to spiritual, excuse me, he was not talking about spirited worship. Rather, he was pointing her to spiritual worship. He was addressing something far deeper than anything produced by purely physical feelings. In spiritual worship, God defines himself. In the spiritual, God also defines Isaiah. When the church truly becomes spiritually healthy, God will show us God's self and totally take over our lives that we may faithfully worship and trust him. God will define us and we will confess, be healed, surrender, and become available and useful instruments for God's divine purpose. The true dread is not whether we appear spiritual, but whether we are spiritual. The healthy church, the church that is well, is first and foremost spiritual. It seeks true communion with its maker. It recognizes its foundation in Jesus Christ and seeks to be transformed daily through inner renewal. Second, a healthy church, following the announcement, announced mission of its founder, communicates the good news or the gospel. The good news is more than beautiful sounds that are pleasant to our hearing. In fact, it's bad news. And that's one thing about this church. I think your mission reached the unchurched. Don't ever lose that mission. I found on my way to 75 years of living that I've had many occasions to visit physicians. And some of you may have that same occasion. During that time, good news has often come in the form of bad news. How many times have we been to a doctor and they check us over and they find something? And then when they check into that, they really find something serious. Bad news becomes good news. However, when one considers the alternative of not knowing and not taking corrective measures which could cause death, the so-called bad news is actually good. Paul warned Timothy to be diligent in his ministry. He told him the time would come when the church would not be committed to sound doctrine. But he, a faithful servant, of the Lord Jesus Christ must not be deterred from his message, from applying that healing salve, from presenting the gospel, no matter how painful. I, I remember as a child that if I, if I did something, cut myself a little bit, mom would put something on, oh, it would burn, it would hurt bad. That was bad news. But then I got better mm -hmm. and everything was okay. So sometimes, Bad news needs to come before we get the good news. He, we, Timothy was told to use every chance he had to present the true gospel and to get people to listen to it. And he was to present the gospel whether people listened, obeyed, or didn't listen and obey. Their health and their well-being depended upon their hearing and responding to the truth. Paul saw the health of the people as connected with truth more than with comfort. Paul did not uh, Paul did not preach a false doctrine. He preached the true doctrine. No matter how well you aim, you know. Uh, one time we 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 may uh, we may go duck hunting. Some of you may do a little duck hunting, and. Uh, I, I thought this statement was good. Let me get it out here. This quote, you can't aim a duck to death. <laughs> it took me a little while to get that and what it really meant. But what they were really saying is you can aim and aim and aim and you'll never get the duck 
until you pull the trigger. And you know that's the same way in us. We can we can aim and aim and aim. And if we're not aiming with the truth, we won't get the duck. Jesus visited Nazareth, where he had been raised. And on the way, that Sabbath day, he stood up and read the words in the scroll of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, a prophecy of the Messiah and the age of the Messiah. Jesus had completed his mission. The statement closed the book and bravely announced that he was the one that was coming. Can you imagine the people that were around him then in his own hometown? The discussion has come to a conclusion. The answer is here. The problem solver has arrived. The Messiah is on sight. This day the scripture is fulfilled, Jesus said, and opening words of comment must have been a shock to those around him and those who heard him. They had known him from boyhood and taken him for granted. When he claimed to be the fulfillment of, it, of the Messianic and the Messiah coming, probably they were astounded and they questioned, isn't this Joseph's son? For them, he was the son of Joseph and Mary by natural birth. He was one of them. How could he be the Messiah? But that did not deter Jesus at all. He continued to preach the gospel. Among healthy people, the resources for their development is not anticipated in that which is outside more than that which is within. Though they did not know or necessarily believe him to be the Messiah, they felt that one of the signs of his authority should be the demonstrator. He should be demonstrating what, what he can do, his powers, his benefits. Jesus anticipated their thoughts. The physician, they said to him, heal yourself. Surely you will quote this proverb to me. The physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what you had heard, what we had heard that you did in Capernaum, where you he had healed and done, done all kinds of good things. They wanted to see the miracles of Jesus. Painfully, Jesus pointed out, he would not only be rejected by his own people, but his greatest ministry would be to the Gentile world. That's you and me. Aren't you glad he chose to bring the gospel to you and me, as well as just to the Jews? This mirror themselves infuriated them, and they even became so angry that they wanted to kill him. And you later read where they did finally put him to death. Jesus brings the truth home. Truly, healthy people accept and honor their own. According to John 1 11, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The healthy church will not base its life or its authenticity or material standards of success. It must not satisfy itself with the values of the world. How many churches have we seen that they, the world has crept in Instead of the church changing the culture, the culture is changing the church. Though we cannot forget that it is in the world, the church must always remember that it cannot live by worldly standards. What is true of the church as an institution is also true of Christians, you and me, as individuals. Jesus is the head of the church. Whenever and wherever his teachings and stated mission guide the church, it will be healthy. I willingly admit that in the modern day, the present day churches, that they have a very compelling attractiveness in many ways. It has powerful images of success. And, and the words, even to the words that we sang this morning, the songs that we sang this morning, the words were so meaningful. And they were scripture. They were Bible. It seemed more popular than in some preceding years. However, looking good is not good enough. I often use the statement, if I were arrested today, would there be enough evidence to convict me? 
You know, we can think about that ourselves for each of our lives. If we were arrested today for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? The true church not only looks good, but it is healthy. Again, you look good, but are you well? You may say, well, why did you bring a message like that to us? It's because I've seen so many churches growing like you all are growing, excited, doing good things, and, and they, they have grown and got to the place where they became so proud of the things they were doing that they forgot their purpose. I, I went to a church up in Pennsylvania where my family all went, and of course we moved down to Salisbury when I was six, so I don't remember a whole lot about it, but we would go back often and sing, and that church would be packed, I mean just people would actually be standing outside the windows to hear the gospel message on the inside. It was a missionary-minded church, and they gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to missions, and they kept a record of all they gave on the board. And they would stress that over and over and over. And you know what happened? They became so proud of what they were giving that they forgot the spirit of the church inside. And now if you go back to that church, if they had 10 to 15 people, it would be a good Sunday for them. Do you really want a healthy church? And my reason for bringing this message was, was just for all of us to recognize the fact that we have to be, remain true to God's word in order for our church to grow. All of the activities are all good, reaching out to people that are unchurched. But keep in mind that we must present the gospel as God would want it presented. Do you want a healthy church? Thank you for allowing me to be here today. I enjoyed it very much.